Okay, um, thank you very much, Nicolas. So our our commentator today is someone um, who really does not need an introduction, and if I were to give her even a very partial introduction, we would go way over time, so I will be very, very brief. Uh, Natalie Zeman Davis is Professor of History Emerita at the University of Toronto and also at Princeton, where she held the Henry Charles Lee Chair. She's the former president of the American Historical Association. She's the recipient of a very, very long list of honors and the author of a list of books and articles that is as distinguished as it is long, including Society and Culture in Early Modern France, The Return of Martin Guerre, Women on the Margins, The Gift in 16th Century France, and Trickster Travels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, we are grateful for these rich gifts of scholarship. <laughs> Just to, so I will now follow on my obligation. <laughs> uh, we have heard about uh, two forms of socioeconomic behavior: uh, finance uh, and tax, including tax farming, borrowing and lending, money work, and gambling both of which have a long tradition of stigma behind them uh, as uh, sinful activities, uh, as dishonorable, mécanique, uh, uh, working with money, uh, conducive to uh, uh, wild dreams and gambling and speculation rather than hard work and so on. Uh, and both papers have shown, among other things, I'm just staying to, onto our theme of obligation and reciprocity, both have shown how these activities were legitimated uh, through associations of one form or another with benevolence, uh, through, in, in, in the financial case also, with the possibility of social advancement, but especially with the, uh, benevolence and the possibility of charity. And secondly, we've heard a, from uh, Charles a critical redefinition of the bounds of exchange and mutual service linking human beings that um, first was heard in the very late 17th century but really comes to the fore in the mid-18th. Reciprocity, a word that has been given a historical historiography today by Charles, uh, and uh, with questions raised about the implications of this definition for uh, forms of distributive justice, for deeper notions of political morality. So I want to start uh, I really want to frame both papers by, by the questions of obligation and reciprocity and want to begin um, by sub somewhat recasting the contrast that Charles made between uh, the notion of reciprocity and what went before. And this is very much in support, in strong support of his viewpoints. I just want to quote one sentence that I want to somewhat recast. Before um, the Enlightenment, Obligations were largely a function of rank, religion or corporation, and the use of coercion to enforce obligation. Obedience, deference, uh, tribute taxes was not unexpected. And he goes on in a very important sentence. The shift from a society of orders held together by subordination to a society of individuals held together by reciprocity. And all I want to recast is the notion of coercion there, because it's, as, the, as the parallel because it seems to me that coercion is involved in both systems, but that what we should compare, both, both have it, and it's surely present in, in, the, in, the, early, in the gift obligation system, but I just want to recast it um, so as to make the significance of reciprocity and, and what, what contextualizes it even sharper. So, uh, if you look at then the, the idea of the gift and obligation in the earlier period, going back for centuries, but uh, it rests upon upon a, a, a primarily vertical image to begin with. God is the source of all we have. Uh, he gave it to us freely. We owe him gratitude. And gratitude always generates obligation to someone. To someone directly, back to God, something you can give gifts God, something you can't. That's the key model. There, there is an alternate model that circulates both in the philosophical tradition and in all kinds of popular lore, which uh, uh, has, can have a more, a more horizontal quality to it, uh, namely, going back to Aristotle without the use of the word reciprocity, namely that we are held together by our services, whether they're services of trade or services of gifts, uh, and they must, and they, and we, they circulate out of, out of, out of, 
out of need, really, that this is the way we behave. But the, the, the key model uh, in the idea of the gift and, and obligation of the earlier period really is one based on, the, on, on a hierarchical image. It's stretched. It stretches to apply to friendship, the gifts of friendship, to the gifts among neighbors, to the gifts among in family, horizontal gifts, uh, as well as being used in the characteristic way of giving gifts up and down, it can be passed up and down the social scale, with no necessarily equivalent among the gifts. It, it, equivalence is, is not required. But what is required um, is that the gift keep moving. That is the obligation and gratitude keep the gift moving. It is not necessarily a model, and you can already see the contrast with reciprocity between two persons. In fact, it's especially in its, in its core, isn't. It, the, the three graces was a frequent way of representing it. Um, one who receives, one who gives, one who passes, one who gives, one who receives, one who passes on. So that it is, is part, in a way, uh, encourages a model that is not uh, uh, closely uh, reciprocal, though I repeat again, it's a model used in close friendships uh, as, as well. The, t the, bo the boundary between gift and contract is, is, is a porous one. Uh, they're not absolutely defined differently, but uh, a, a key difference is uh, in the ambiguity, always at least in principle insisted upon, in the gift obligation, obligation relation rather than clear, uh, sharp uh, equity. Uh, and there is, well, we won't go into the, the and similarly there is a porous boundary between gift and sale. The, the tension to, to do, use a parallel with Charles's comments, the tension is not so much in regard to interest and non-self-interest. It's kind of assumed that all gifts, it is said that all gifts are supposed to be without interest. It's always assumed that they have interest because there's always going to be some kind of return. And the tension really has more to do with the pressure, whether, uh, whether, how much pressure is can be placed on a recipient, so that uh, so that rather than living in, in a world of ambiguity and some uncertainty about what the return might be, turning it into a bribe. So it's at a different moment in the in the in the transaction that the tension is most serious for what we've seen. Now with reciprocity, uh, the I mean it's it's been spelled out. We have a uh, just want to underscore the contrast. We have an image of where the return is most clearly seen between equal individuals. <laughs> Uh, uh, to be, um, and, I, and I quote him again, it, it is si to be situated within, and he was quoting Keith Baker, but he agrees, a society of morally commensurate individuals. And the model was, to begin with a horizontal model, ideally between uh, two com commensurate uh, individuals. Here too, as we've heard, it could be stretched, if the, if the horizontal, <laughs> vertical one can be stretched, and all this can be stretched, in, with tensions uh, to be cover many different kinds of cases, but its its clearest case, its core model, it seems to me, is that horizontal one uh, with individuals who, in, in principle, are equal, and where the, the utility is a notion of equal utility, rather this ambiguity that we f find in the gratitude uh, horizontal model, and the tension, as he stressed, is is between the notion of a of a self. Uh, self-interested exchange, but it's okay because the reciprocity will work out. It will be mutual utility, equal utility, and the generosity, um, the, the boundless uh, extravagant giving that sacrifice might uh, require. And here again there was the, the tension between well, the, between the natural law where trade really, it really the model here becomes trade in a way, in, in natural law, you, you, uh, the economic model uh, and the self-interested model, which is a, where, he, where the imagery he used was political. Uh, that is, if, if in the earlier, ca if the, in the other model, um, the imagery of, of complete giving might be a religious notion. Here, when you, when you use the language, when you contrasted the natural law of giving, the model really becomes almost like trade, the equivalent trade. The, the, the model of, of generous giving was political, uh, and the, the, the sacrifice that the citizen uh, might, uh, might make. Uh, so the, uh, so the, uh, the question then that I that had, well, I really had two questions to, uh, uh, to ask you about, uh, I mean, perhaps not central, but uh, one, one I think you would assume, that the older model persists, 
uh, the one, the one, be the, the one that talks about a gift and and obligation. That 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 particular model persists along with this this new uh, 18th century enlightenment or whatever commercial uh, creation. I am assuming that I don't know if you want to, would want to think about that. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, since I'm working on slavery and maybe I'm preoccupied with it, but it did strike me as very interesting that this model of, of equality, of reciprocity based on equality, emerges at a time when a great many French citizens of, are involved in, in the world of, of plantation slavery, where that is a very, very difficult thing to think about, about the kind of uh, distributive justice and, uh, and that can, and is, is that important maybe uh, in some of the thing, in some other areas that I have worked on, such as penal reform, and here in the case of the Netherlands more than, more than France, it turned out to be quite important to reconceptual and reconceptualizing equality in, in, in penal reform that it wasn't like what was going on in the colonies. In other words, the slavery was an almost maybe semi-consciously a counterexample. So I just wondered, uh, maybe this is derailing. Uh, in Julia's, <laughs> so, uh, Julia's paper, uh, I think, is a real contribution to our one-sided view that we often have of negative images. Indeed, negative images, which go along with all kinds of financial, marital, political, dazzling success of financiers but in, in, in social life. Uh, I, I, uh, being an earlier historian, uh, I just would stress that it's, it's an old, it's a very, as you, I'm sure you know, a very old uh, struggle and the, some of the positive images uh, actually go back to you can find them in the 16th century just to give you a so this, in a way this this tension is an old regime tension which gets only resolved by the 19th century uh, 16th century commercial arithmetic which I once happened to write about actually uh, which describe precisely processes of compound interest buying and lending in detail are dedicated, some of them, to, to, noble, to noblemen, sometimes to tax officers and other times to noblemen, glorified that way. There's the movement of the noblesse commerçante, uh, which, tr which tried, uh, in, in some sense unsuccessfully, to counter the image that, that uh, overseas trade could not be noble by passing laws. There's the marchand philosophe, who emerges among the Huguenots, uh, and others in Amsterdam, but I think with the, the, the merchant can be learned as as the ones who are collecting things all over the Pacific and the Atlantic were in their in their trade. So, uh, the what what seemed to me I would like to ask you about this. What seemed to me interesting about the examples that you gave us, and indeed it's true of some of the examples that I have from the earlier period as well, that the legitimation had to do with social advancement. Stop being debauched and living well. Uh, uh, and then an example which you, one of the more Marivaux examples which you didn't, you had to cut a little, uh, but where Pluto becomes the, 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 the uh, image of the financier uh, and he, he seeks to solve all kinds of family problems, settles everybody's debts. Uh, and in the other examples you did, you did give, the legitimation really came from benevolence and charity, it, from a, a, the, the, the rightfulness of individual achievement and wealth, and then giving to others. Uh, it, it was really not reciprocity, it was gener generous gift giving uh, to, to, the, to those in need. And my, uh, uh, and except for one of the quotes from Duclos, and what you said about the financier, uh, we didn't hear in these legitimations very much about what financiers do. <laughs> So that the legitimation came not from, from the work itself. And I wondered did, um, about this as a problem. In some of the earlier works, I say it's, it's other forms, uh, it's, you, you, they're, they're, they're hard pressed to actually describe it uh, be, because it seems, it would seem oppressive or it would seem manipulative or dishonest in some ways. So I'm asking you whether, whether they can come to terms with it. The examples that I happen to know where, where they do try to come to terms with it are two. Uh, one is, uh, and they're similar, one is, is a text by Savary, Le Parfait Négociant, 
where he simply says, he talks about the actual work of doing finance, business, banking, and so forth, and simply says that it's, that it's honorable. Uh, as long as it's done, and uh, as, I mean, he describes it in detail, as long as it is done with honesty. And similarly, this is a little off from your examples, but having worked on, on, the, on examples of Jewish merchants, and specifically bankers, who are involved in Jewish versions of bank, uh, the, they use the word dishonor. They use the word dishonor about their trade as long as it's done honestly without, without uh, cheating people. In other words, the kind of things that are said about craftsmen. So I don't know if, if that figures in the novels, but I'm just suggesting, asking that question. And so uh, Nicholas, wonderful, wonderful uh, example of this, uh, of the, the lottery of 31, 33, which combines moral sentiments and self-interest, which con combines uh, generosity and love of gain, uh, it's, it's the, the, again, these wonderful quotes, the moral value of the gift with the, the excitement of gambling, the excitement of, of gambling, which is just allowed to be part of the scene. Uh, a, um, a, it's a very interesting example. I mean, there's much more to his paper than that, but I just want to focus on it because it allows us to hold, hold the papers together. The, you, uh, Nicola gave, uh, re reported the examples of crit critique of uh, lotteries from the early 19th century. Uh, they, as, as I was just looking at the recent issue of the uh, of, of French historical studies where Cuthbert has uh, a marvelous article on the Royal Lottery of 1776 where you have uh, Turgot absolutely opposed, and Marseille absolutely opposed, all the usual things. It's gambling, uh, it keeps the poor, it gives the poor bad habits, they get to depend on the wrong kind of thing. With Necker finding it much better than taxes, at least it's voluntary, uh, and, uh, uh, is, and as long as it's done in a way that's not corrupt. So it's a very, very old, uh, it's an old, art, not very old, but certainly an old uh, uh, argument, it, uh, along with the, the 19th century critique that, that uh, such a thing is backward, uncivilized, cor uh, certainly going to lead to corruption and hard on the, on the poor. And the wealth, when it comes, if it is undeserved when you get it. It's just gambling. Undeserved as, in the worst case with financiers, they manipulate, and it's undeserved. And I guess we're all thinking about 2008 in here, trying to keep that out of the way. <laughs> it's undeserved gambling. But never mind, we're staying on the subject. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a, the model that comes out here is that it's commercially organized, that it's this combination of, of gain and the love of gambling and generosity and gift. It's commercially organized. Uh, it is for a very, very worthy cause. Uh, it is, it's done uh, with, and, and indeed it is done with free labor of, of the veterans themselves. Uh, it it uh, combines, I mean, it, it combines it, the desire to acquire and the willingness to give in a way that seems to be not reciprocity and not a vestige of gift obligation. It, doesn't, it seems to have neither of these, but it just comfortably puts this, everything together with the state, war, <laughs> Uh, commercial enterprise, a uh, gift not a tax, but not a fully a gift, uh, and, and, hope, and hope for return, although some might say without reason. So it's, it's a very, very interesting uh, 20th century pulling together of things. So my, my questions, uh, I just had a few questions. Uh, one, um, were you, you said at the very end a little bit about some people having reservations. Were, were there critical reservations at the time? Were there defenses? Was there a defense of, lo of just simple lottery at the time? And uh, did, the, did the church or the socialists? I mean, that, that was one question. And the, uh, the other question that I had was, since this is a period in the wake of Mose, uh, Marcel Mose and Durkheim and so forth, did this experiment also have, did this successful experiment have an impact on sociologists, on social theorists, on economists? I mean, are, maybe have you, I just, you know, is, did, did this lead to any rethinking of social issues uh, and, or, or politics at the time? I, uh, I'll just conclude with a, a quote from Leon, Leon Modena. Uh, 
this is off the subject, but I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, the Jewish rabbi of uh, early 17th century Venice, who's a very learned man and an extremely important person uh, in, in Jewish theology and Jewish po po polemics at the time, and a great orator, but he was also an inveterate gambler. We know all about this from his autobiography, uh, where he gambled away daughter's dowries and all kinds, at least not other people, at least not the congregation's money. And he wrote a very interesting uh, dialogue uh, uh, on gambling, in which one person supports gambling and the other person opposes it. And I just wanted to hear, since I've asked you what people said about it, what he said in favor of gambling. I mean, he talked about all the terrible things that it did to him and his, fam and his family. But in favor of gambling, he said it taught you about the chances in human life and how fragile and vulnerable we are. Uh, how you really don't know what to expect. So I think I'll leave uh, uh, Rabbi Leon Mavin's message. It's my final word. <laughs> Okay, well we have about uh, six minutes on, on the clock here. I think we can go over a few minutes, but I'm cognizant of the fact that the day started at 8.30 uh, for everybody, so I don't think we should go much more than about five, five minutes over. What I'd like to do is ask the participants all to come up around the lectern. That's, I think, the easiest way to respond to questions. Since we don't have that much time, I would ask that we not start out with responses to Natalie's questions and comments, but that as trained public speakers and pedagogues, you simply work those into your, um, your responses to the questions. So, <coughs> so Ron Schechter. For all great papers and a great comment, I, I just wanted to ask Charles a question about the relationship between reciprocity and vengeance, because it was interesting that uh, that Retif de la Bretonne sort of contrasted reciprocity and vengeance but you know one of the first things that i was thinking is that there's is actually an interesting kind of parallel relationship between reciprocity and vengeance if reciprocity is about sort of uh, about obligations then uh, it can also be about uh, punishment in the face of, you know, uh, vi <laughs> violating those obligations. And I'm wondering if the, when, when we're trying to understand the French Revolution, you know, one of the words that comes up again and again is vengeance. And uh, sometimes the deputies sort of temper this by calling it the vengeance of the laws, mm -hmm. right? Because they want to distinguish it from what they probably also think of I I at some level as this kind of antiquated um, or atavistic uh, practice. But what, what do you think? I mean, is there some sort of relationship, you know, insofar as reciprocity kind of becomes an important yeah. concept, does vengeance also? Yeah, I think, I think it was in one of those quotes. Yeah, so, so um, negative reciprocity, which is uh, a category that anthropologists identify, um, is, is there also in the 18th century. I wish I could go on about the similarities between the way anthropologists are wrestling with this and the way they're wrestling, wrestling with these ideas in, in the late 18th century. Yes, it's there. Um, and the quote that I showed here of um, uh, Retif de la Bretonne, who says r the reason we're f r the reason for our universal, f you know, philanthropy, our giving without expecting a return, is to prevent violence against us. He's talking about vengeance. Um, that you can gift your way out of violence. It, it, yeah, generosity prevents uh, violence. Yeah. What, is, and what is more reciprocal than an eye for an eye? Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> yes, up there. Thank you, uh, Pierre Prosegle, uh, Yale Work. I'm, I'm a first war historian, so it was great being here. I learned a great deal of fascinating paper. Uh, very quickly, just a first question for. Uh, um, just take one question per person. So, okay. Okay, yeah. Charles, uh, whether you're thinking about taking what is uh, clearly really interesting intellectual history into a social history of reciprocity, and the reason why I'm asking this is my own work on social mobilization in the First World War strikes me as just a perfect illustration of of all those tensions that you are 
um, describing an interesting moment where public discourse is just awash with uh, discussion of sacrifice, of course, obligations, but when the the the, the coercive powers of, of the states are also clearly determining a great deal of, 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 of social life and where uh, social movements are, to me, including strikes and including mutinies, are a very good way for them to work out in very concrete terms and ways those notions are, uh, of reciprocity. Um. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, um, I, I, yeah, there's an ongoing resonance uh, uh, with these, I think, with, with, with ideas of reciprocity. Is, and, but but it's, it's the liberal notion. I'd be interested in, in talking to you afterwards to see if in the early 20th century this liberal <coughs> notion of, um, you know, that, that reciprocity works out automatically if you just let, uh, if you depoliticize it. Uh, that separation between politics and the economy um, that liberals try to cultivate over 200 years, you know, uh, I'd be interested in hearing, uh, talking to you afterwards about that. Chris Clark. Yeah, this is a question for um, your opinion, but uh, in with the group I see in the lottery. I thought that, I mean, I must say, I thought this was a fantastic session. This is the best session I've been to. I thought all the papers spoke to each other in really interesting ways. But um, my question was just about whether, to the extent to which, I mean, on. Do we, do we hmm. need this thing? Can't be um, we are, we are making this. a recording oh, I to, see. So, to, to, sorry, to sorry, it, so. sorry for the people at home. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and so my question was just, well, I mean, charity based on gifts is actually not a great solution to this kind of problem. I mean, I was, I, you, you put me in mind when I was listening to this uh, of the pietists in, uh, in late 17th and early 18th century Germany who precisely wanted to get away from charity for two reasons. One is that a gift turns the recipient into a pure recipient of the gift. The, the recipient can either refuse the gift or become a kind of attachment, a sort of dependent. And nobody, well, many people feel uncomfortable with that status. And I'm sure the, that was an issue for the Gurli Kassi. And the other thing is that a gift is dependent on the generosity of the giver, which can you know vary greatly from according to mood and and so on. Whereas what the lottery does is sort of mediates and creates a financial a business effectively, which is run by the guru kasi, mm -hmm. and it's so it takes that directness of the exchange completely out of, mm. out of the picture. Mm. Uh, uh, was, is, that, is that correct? Is, have I understood that correctly? That yeah, that that, that, that's the idea. That was the idea when we move from pure call for donations, so call to generosity, to something mixing different values and the idea that the lottery and then they were part of the lottery uh, would be something uh, much more permanent. But at the beginning the state and the Gulkasse thought that the lottery would be only for one year. But then for the four or five first years uh, the, the operation uh, was you know uh, uh, prolonged and then it, be, it became permanent but uh, and of course uh, it then became a, a fundamental source of revenue for the associations uh, and much more um, stable than uh, generosity donation or, or this stuff. Michael Cross. Um, I just have a quick question for Julia. Alan says that a little bit. Uh, these are all fantastic. I've got lots of questions for everyone, but I limit myself to a, to a question uh, for Julia. It seems to me, yeah, thanks. Uh, it seems to me that uh, many of your examples come from the first half of the 18th century, particularly seven, maybe 1720s to early 1750s. Um, and uh, there, there, there seems to be parallels here between a, an evolution in the luxury debate as well. When this is a period which, when, in which um, the defenses of luxury are formulated. And then in the second half of the 18th century, there's a kind of repost against luxury. This seems to be maybe following a similar uh, evolution. Um, and first, is that true? What do you think about that? And, and, and further, I mean, d d should this enter into our, our periodization of the Enlightenment at all? Is there something, not to fetishize the 1750s, um, but uh, is there something going on here maybe in the 20s to 40s period that we need to consider that maybe we've been missing? So anyway, just a general question. Thank you for that question. Um, I th thank you also for, for pointing out the, the parallels with the luxury debate and of course your, your own work. Um, I do think the question of periodization is an interesting one and here I also have to thank uh, Natalie Zeman Davis for pointing out that in fact there is more grist for my pro-financier mill <laughs> from, from the earlier uh, centuries. Yes. Um, and I think um, insofar as there is some uh, reflection on 
um, merit and uh, social mobility and so on in these texts, although it gets refracted in perhaps somewhat unusual ways, um, I think absolutely it's useful to move backwards a little bit because some of these figures are in fact associated with the Enlightenment or an Enlightenment and there are other examples as well. Um, there are passages in the Confession of Rousseau where he says, uh, you know, you, you see him among the fermiers généraux who are his patrons. Uh, this is from the 17, this is about a period uh, that was during the 1740s. Also in the 1740s, if you read a novel like The Lettre d'une Peruvienne by Madame de Graffigny, uh, the money theme is very important and there's no explicit discussion in that book about financiers or money workers. But at the same time, if you're sort of looking for this theme, as I decided to do, um, you could very much read it in line with these other texts. And so one by one, when you add them together, you find this kind of modern debate or, or modernizing debate, if you will, um, you know, the, the pro-financier aspect of it. You do find it uh, going backwards. And the example that uh, Natalie Davis mentioned, this play by Marivaux, uh, Le Triomphe de Plutus, which I talked about in the longer version of this paper but decided to excise for the sake of time uh, today, that was first performed in 1728 um, and it's a satire but I think the point is very much the same. The financier figure who in this case is the, the god Pluto uh, disguised as a financier, <laughs> he's, he's definitely the, the benevolent, <coughs> rational, responsible figure and so I think the answer would be yes, that this does have impl implications for, for notions of, of the Enlightenment or Enlightenment in, Enlightenment values, sure. I think we're going to have to leave it there. We've already gone over, but thank you all very much for coming and join me in a round of applause. Thank you, David.